course not. Of course not. I can uh, I can talk about that all day now that it's been out on the interwebs and kind of went viral there. Yeah. Um, so specifically, uh, just for people listening, what the post was about was I struggled with bulimia for close to 12 years, and no one knew. Um, God, I don't even think I knew uh, for a majority of the time because I was in denial. But it's a mixture of primarily bulimia with some binge eating and as well as some periods of not eating at all. But the, the primary culprit was, was bulimia. And it all boiled down to me really just not loving myself. Um, I was just, you know, given my childhood, I, I just, I had a very, I love my brother and my siblings and whatnot, but I just grew up in a household that was surrounded with drugs and alcohol and abuse and things that are just not conducive to a loving, caring environment. And from a very early age, I just moving all the time, being a new kid in school, not getting support at home, I just always felt like I was never good enough and that I would never be skinny enough or I would never be fast enough or I would never be anything along those lines. And it started very young. And it took me a long time. I mean, I've been on multiple deployments. I've been all over this world in multiple countries throughout the Marine Corps. I've met tons of people. And, you know, what it really took was me to, unfortunately, break down, you know, after getting injured, injured and forced to kind of do some self-reflection to realize it. But the root of all my problem is I was trying to prove things to everybody else instead of just being happy where I was and loving what I was capable of and what I was doing. So... After 12 years, I had uh, Stephanie Rupert from Paleo for Women uh, met me at the Ancestral Health Symposium in Boston, and me, her, and Abel went out for drinks one night, and uh, 2 o'clock in the morning in an alley in Boston, we're having this deep conversation, and and it kind of all came flooding out, and uh, I shared my views with them and my issues, and that got me started talking about them, and I realized that it was ready. To, I was ready to share it with the world and kind of help people, but, you know, it's just... To, to, to hit on a self-image and the body image, and the main part for me is, uh, and I, I tell people this all the time, like most of the emails I get from readers and from fans or people having questions, they're like, hey, what's the secret to a six-pack? Hey, how do you stay so lean? And, and the funny thing is, it's never been easier for me than it, than it happened to be when I started loving myself and not caring about how I looked anymore. You know, and I've shared that on Abel's podcast and a few other ones, but it's so true because scientifically speaking, you know, if you start looking at the reaction of stress and increased cortisol production leading to fat stores, things along these lines, if you're always constantly thinking about how you want to look and how you want to look better and, and you're forcing your body into a, a fight or flight state, you're always going to be under excess stress and you're never actually going to be able to truly rest and let your body heal and burn calories like it needs to or burn the fuel that it needs to to get you to look like you want. And the number one secret really is just to love and appreciate yourself because it doesn't really matter what you look like on the outside. You know, it's completely how you feel on the inside. And I, uh, I don't know how to put it in words how important it is because it literally changed my life when I had this realization. And, and sometimes it takes an aha moment for people. But if I could make a recommendation to anyone, it would be just to kind of take some time to do some self-reflection to figure out why you're training the way you're training, why you're eating the way you're eating and figuring out if you're doing it for yourself or if you're doing it to make yourself look better in other people's eyes. And if you're not doing it for yourself, then it's time to sit down and reevaluate your goals and, and truly work on being happy. George, that's some really powerful stuff. I appreciate you sharing that with, with us and the listeners and everything. Um, well, I, I really also like the way you focused on paying it forward. Um, can you tell us the story about the Starbucks thing and, and, and why, you, why this is so important to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the Starbucks thing, there, there were two. The thing that I, I didn't re- the first one that went like really, really viral on Facebook, I was home in, in Boston um, visiting when I was there for the Ancestral Health Symposium. And I don't have a Whole Foods within like 60 miles of me here where I live in California. So I was sitting at Whole Foods eating lunch because um, I was taking in the fact that I didn't have to eat lunch. I had some organic food to, to eat and pick from a salad bar and stuff myself. And I was sitting outside, and I saw this gentleman pull in the parking lot in his car. He parked his car, and he hit the car in front of him. He backed up and parked his car like nothing had happened and went in the store. One of the employees from Whole Foods actually saw the gentleman hit the car, and he stood out there by the car, uh, wrote down the license plate information, 
went in the store to call the man over the loudspeaker to have him out and confront him. And this kid was probably like 17 years old. I was so impressed that he had like the, the moral courage to stand up and do the right thing. So I just kind of stayed there in a the distance to see what happened. And then this guy comes out and he was probably 35, 40 years old, covered in tattoos, bald guy, very intimidating looking. And he kind of just almost like attacked this kid, like just pretty much forced him, intimidated him into fear and kind of reclusion. And that's at the point where I decided that I didn't like that too much. And I, uh, I left my lunch on the table and I, I calmly walked over to the gentleman until he got a little irate. And then I returned with a raised voice and some, some threats and, I removed him from the situation, and I stood there with him until the um, the employee was able to go get the manager. It actually happened to be the manager of the Whole Foods store, and then they called the police, and the police came and took care of the whole situation, and the manager of Whole Foods thanked me by giving me, uh, I think it was a $50 gift certificate to Whole Foods, and I had just eaten, so I decided that the best thing I could do was to go up the street to another grocery store and find someone that needed it and gave it away. And that kind of sparked my whole paying it forward more than I used to. Like there was, um, you know, that thing got posted on Facebook and got liked like 5,700 times in probably like two days. And I was kind of, kind of shocked. And I was like, you know, I can make a difference for this and I can get people to kind of change their mindset a little bit. And, And before that I had, gone into Trader Joe's and bought grocery cards and gift cards and gave them the cashier and told them to give them to anyone in need. So I started practicing a little more. I go to the coffee shop that one of my friends manages and I just give her my credit card and I tell her to pay for like the next 10 to 15 orders. And no one knows it's for me. And I kind of just sit there to, to take witness because I like to see how people react and what it does. And it's always, I'm always curious to know, like, when I see these people walking, looking somber, sad, like they need their coffee to kind of get their day going or, you know, just to feel better and and to see them, like, instantly shift to a smile, knowing that they could go out and leave that coffee shop and go home and make a difference in someone else's life kind of motivates me. And uh, the reason that I do this is uh, I lost my father on December 6th of 2008 to brain and lung cancer, and before I lost him from March 5th of 2008 until December, I was home taking care of my father full time through chemo, through radiation, um, the amputation of his left leg. We went from full paralysis to walking on a prosthesis to having a stroke and eventually losing my father. And I spent probably in that time frame, um, it was seven months. I, I probably spent six months of it sleeping and living in hospitals all over the state of Massachusetts. And, most people would feel alone and I was just overwhelmed with the support that I got from the most random strangers I'd ever met in my life from the oncologist to the charge nurses to the cafeteria people to my friends and my friends that lived in the area the ambulance drivers used to bring me coffee they used to bring me blankets they would check on me and check on my father and and literally for six or seven months even though the experience was horrendous I had people that were always there trying to kind of be like a shining light and a glimmer of hope for me. And they didn't know me. They didn't know me from the next person, but they took the time out of their day to make sure that me and my father were okay or the best that we could be. And I never let that go, you know, and once I lost my father and I realized how much of a difference it made in the end of his life and in my life in general, that changed me as a human being and especially as a man. And I refocused all my ideals and what I thought was important in this world. And I vowed to make it my passion to every day make a difference in someone else's life. Even if it's just holding the door or smiling or hugging someone or complimenting someone or paying for a coffee or buying groceries or buying gas or maybe paying someone's mortgage for a month when I can ever do that. Like anything I can do, I just make sure every day my focus isn't about myself. It's just about doing one thing to make someone else's day better. And it's all just to pay back everybody that did it for me and to kind of say thank you for making the end of my father's life as pleasurable as possible. Wow. Again, thank you for sharing that. That's that's some really awesome info. There's a phrase I like, and it's, um, your character is forged in the fires of your adversities, and you really seem to be good at that, uh, forging solid character through hard times. Any tips you can give everybody on living a genuine life and, and kind of turning lemons into lemonade? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I don't know if you saw my new T-shirt yesterday, but my new T-shirt say, when life hands you lemon, eat, eat bacon. So 
I don't, I don't do the lemon to lemonade anymore. I'm now a fan of when life hands you lemons, eat bacon and all paleo mindset. So, um, but yeah, honestly, you know, like there, there's a lot of advice I could give people and I could sit here and preach and go down self-reflection. But to me, the easiest thing to do is just to make sure that you're living your life for a purpose, that you have a goal and you have an intention and that you're doing it by staying true to yourself, that you're never deterring from your own morals or your values you're not stepping on people to get in your way and you're kind of doing it in the most beneficial way for everybody because there is no point in success if I'm alone at the top. I don't ever want to be there. I want to be successful and I want all my best friends and family in the world to be with me. I mean, I joke all the time with my paleo buddies like from Primal Palette and Balanced Bites and my business partner, Abel, that I was like, you guys watch. I was like, I'm going to win the lottery one day and you're all going to live on the same street because I'm going to buy every one of you a house and you're going to live near me. And it's not because I had them or I would have the money and want to spend it. I just want to be around other people to share these amazing things with. And if you're doing things, you know, just to try and get your way to the top or stepping on people in the way or just kind of losing focus of, of what your true passion is, then it's always going to get in your way and it's never going to be beneficial. So my number one advice to everyone is always just to stay true to yourself. You know, if you ever feel like, you know, you're not really happy or you're forcing yourself to do something or, you feel guilty after you do it, it, it's the time to look in the mirror because you never know when the day is going to end and you never know when you might not be here tomorrow. I've unfortunately had to learn that lesson a lot in my career as an active duty Marine, losing friends way too young for the sacrifice of this country and then losing family members to diseases and other problems. And, and it's something that I truly live by now because I need to appreciate every day and I need people to know that I love them and I care about them and I can't have them misconstrue my actions or my attitude one day as negative and then end up never being able to speak to them again. So the best thing I can say is just to kind of live a positive lifestyle and every day make it a goal to make a difference in someone's life. And, and I'm not asking for big things. I'm, I'm asking people to hold doors. I'm asking people to say thank you. I'm asking people to compliment someone on their smile or their hair or their outfit of the, of the day or just saying good morning to someone when their head is down to pick them up or anything along those lines is, is the best way I go about it. Awesome, awesome tips. Just great information, George. Uh, so you have a cookbook, The Caveman Feast. Tell us a little bit about The Caveman Feast um, and what kind of recipes you have in there and everything about that. Yeah, so The Caveman Feast is, is just a huge, huge collaboration between me and Abel from Fat Burning Man. Uh, I don't have a lot of time in my days due to my job, and Abel is like a really genius guy about putting ebooks together, but he sucks at cooking food and taking photos. So it actually, it was actually a, a partnership made in heaven. And, you know, we met at Paleo Effects and he approached me and, you know, he's like, Hey, I would love to do something together. I was like, Hey, me too. I just don't have time. And we started bouncing ideas back and forth and we're like, let's do this. So uh, caveman feast is a collection of every recipe that I have made since going paleo up until the day about the day it published. Obviously I've made new recipes since then, but the collection is, I think in the book there's, there's 207 or 208 recipes and they range everywhere from beef to pork to chicken. There's not a lot of fish. I'm sorry. There's only a few of those to desserts. I think there's 40 or 50 crock pot meals. Like I pretty much covered every basis and I can honestly say that the longest recipe in that book to make prep wise would probably be like 20 to 30 minutes. So it's four people that live a lifestyle like I do that are always busy kind of having a plan meal to head kind of staying in front of the power curve and everything can be adapted. You can double them. You can triple them. You can feed a family of 10 or a family of two. I mean, I make my big meals and I freeze them and cook them and eat them all week for lunches and breakfast and whatever I can do in a hurry. So this book was just my way of giving everything I've made to everybody to kind of have and share and help them on this journey. And then of course, on top of the book, when you buy the book, you get Abel's, 30 day intro to paleo you get all the podcasts we've recorded you get some coaching some stuff along those lines it's just all in all it's just an amazing package that can really benefit so many people and that's what i want awesome awesome well thank you so much george you guys be sure to visit civilized cavemancooking.com check out george's website check out his book civil or caveman feast and uh thank you so much for joining us and sharing all those nuggets of wisdom george oh i appreciate it thank you so much for having me